Hello, my name is Ajay Rai and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Today I'm happy to be joined once again by Professor Lakshman Pereira. Professor Pereira is an academic scholar as well as currently being a member in the Council for Education at the Commonwealth and a member of the Royal Commonwealth Society. He is also the father of three daughters and a grandfather to four and, believe it or not, he is 87 years old. Professor Pereira, thank you for joining us on The Defining Moment. Well, it's a pleasure to come here and to chat with you about spiritual matters. Well, thank you very much for coming and, and giving us this insight into actually today's topic, which is a, a term you've coined yourself, consciousness absolute. Now, that's a, a very broad topic, and uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to how you're going to explore that. Uh, before we do, though, I'd like to kind of go into some basic questions about faith and about spirituality, and I'm hoping you can give us your insight. The first one is actually, can you tell us from your understanding, what is the nature of God? There are two ways of looking at this. From very ancient times, people have believed that there is a God up in the skies and that is part of the traditional religions. The Hindus call God different names but the Muslims call him Allah and the Christians call him God and uh, this is basic to all religions that there is some person or some one up there who is normally regarded as, as a person to whom, with whom you can communicate. But when you get to certain levels of spiritual experience, spiritual life, you come to realize that there is no person as such, that it is a kind of a, an experience, a reality, that is beyond the concept of persons, beyond the concepts of God, and it is and the oneness, which is the, the absolute reality, or <clears throat> as some people call it, consciousness absolute. And that is the experience which these mystics have had when they have come to that kind of, uh, when they have that kind of experience. Okay, so this consciousness absolute is obviously uh, something uh, a new phrase, something, as I said, you've coined. And uh, before you tell us more about that, I, I have some more questions for you, in fact. Um, I'd like to ask you, what or, or who is a saint? A saint is normally regarded as a holy person who has had some kind of spiritual experience and who has, uh, who treads the spiritual path to reach the top, the top of the mountain. That's the saint. And in various religions you get other names sometimes, as Swamis and Sadhus, and uh, that is more or less the same. They're holy people, different people from the ordinary people, and they're looked up to by people who want to go up the spiritual path. Okay, so anyone who's on a spiritual path, ultimately their goal is to become a saint. In a sense, saint, and uh, that of course is what is experienced. From some become swamis, some become sadhus, and, and uh, but uh, it is actually an experience that goes beyond that. Those are concepts. You have to go beyond conceptual patterns and, and concepts, and that's that is a oneness. And you say nothing, neti, neti, nothing, nothing. There's nothing regarding concepts. It's a positive, something positive, positive and negative, an absolute reality that is there, all over, everywhere. So for those of us who are not, let's say, inclined to going the path of becoming a saint, simply because maybe that's not uh, familiar to us, how can one pursue a life of, let's say, ultimate happiness? Happiness is a word that is for ordinary people where they enjoy things and enjoy life. And you can, you can go about it and you have a good job, earn adequate things and things that you want 
must do, and that is happiness in terms of this worldly life. <clears throat> but happiness in terms of spiritual life is not happiness itself, because there's no you to enjoy anything. Ultimately, that you that enjoys things disappears. So happiness in, in a kind of everyday sense is just a, a limited to the, the limited, realm of physical Limited to the physical side of life. So there is a happiness beyond that, and what is that? You can call it, some call it bliss and ecstasy, where you get kind of a feeling of uh, serenity and calm and peace and so on. And it is really beyond that as well, when you become one with the, when we become one with the ultimate reality. The, you don't become part of that, that part, that ultimate reality emerges within you and you disappear. That's uh, an amazing concept. <laughs> Professor Pereira, I, I'd like to ask you, in the world that we live in, how can anyone achieve mind and body unity? It is said that the longest journey starts with the first foot forward. So do you do your religious, uh, religious things, going to viharas, churches and so on, and then you get to the next step, which is a form of spiritual, spiritual uh, life, and that is uh, the commonest thing is meditation, and you practice meditation. And that is a technique that you do in order to purify and energize yourself and to make the chakras in your body positive. And when that happens, and the, taller, the highest chakra on the top of your head is the Sahasrara chakra, and when that happens, uh, there's a sense of absolute bliss and calm and ecstasy, and uh, the self disappears. So you, you mentioned the word chakra, that's a, that's a Hindu concept, isn't it? Can chakra you... is a Hindu concept, and chakra means wheel, and you get eight chakras from the bottom of the spine to the top of the head. And uh, there is a shakti or prana, psychic energy that goes gradually up and up the, that channel in the, in, the, in the middle, which is called Susumna. And there are two channels, Ida Pingala, where when you meditate and you lead a spiritual life, it goes up and comes down, up and And then Shakti or Prana gradually goes up and up to the various chakras. When it comes to the various chakras, you have a feeling of uh, a different feeling. And especially if you come to the heart chakra, everything is different and it's, it's a sort of, you get, to, get into an experience that cannot be explained. When the chakras come to the Anya chakra, that is at the top of the head, that's the time when you get, when you have certain powers and energy and so on. And when it comes to the top of the head, which is Sasraja chakra, then you are different. Is that the state in which you no longer sense to be, Anything, but yes, that's the right. ultimate reality yes. or ultimate the divine reality, reality comes yes. into you. Yes, that's right. So the, the chakra is a way of understanding, um, having like a toolkit within yourself in mm. order to elevate yourself spiritually. All from the spiritual, uh, spiritual practices would lead to the development of that. Even at the at the early stages where you worship God, where you give alms to people and so on, that those uh, 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 help for the Shushumna, uh, to Shakti to sort of go up and up, and gradually it happens. Shakti being power. Sh Shakti means power, and prana means energy. So once you reach that state, that's something that, uh, let's go back now to this phrase, consciousness absolute, because that's how you describe it. Let's, let's look at that a bit more closely. In, in your words, obviously, from you know, directly coming from you, the man who's coined this phrase, consciousness absolute, what is consciousness absolute? It is the ultimate reality, where this world is an illusion. And in this world, there are positive and negative things that come, depending on what people do and what things happen and so on. 
and uh, when you come when you reach certain stages you realize that this is just uh, a kind of an illusion a dream and enlightenment is where you awaken from a dream if in a physical world you are in a dream you think as if it's everything is reality in the dream but when you get out get out, get get when you wake up when you wake up it's a different world altogether and that's, that's an example of what the spiritual experience of samadhi and enlightenment is like it's awakening from this world which is a dream and that is the absolute reality the realization that the the life that we know is itself just a, an illusion in a dream. sense an illusion so what's the meaning of that illusion is that everything happens and good and bad and so on and people uh, love each other fight with each other collective groups uh, continue to meet together or fight together fight fight and be apart and it is everything that's, that's happening in the world but it's just and a dream. if you bring it down to to bits and pieces it is <coughs> uh, subatomic particles which are the body and so on and then you get the the thoughts and ideas and everything and people and people getting together and and egos emerging and there are the, not only physical ego, egos but collective egos where people cooperate or they are against each other and they identify each other as separate and that ego disappears so there is consciousness absolutely even absolute. in subatomic particle particles everywhere in subatomic particles in the life around us in the physical world and uh, that is absolute consciousness but life comes in when life comes in is different and when you get ego consciousness then we think in terms of human life so humans are the ones with the ego yes animals also have egos and is that a good or a bad thing because they have to fight in order to live uh, yes of course and uh, but is it a good or a bad thing because obviously i mean the, the notion is that we need to get rid of it and kind of go back to a state of nothingness So is yeah, having ego stage, egos are necessary it is. to to live but when you come to certain stages of spiritual life then you feel that you have to sort of discard it when you don't discard it it happens you develop to such a stage where the ego disappears not that you can't give up the ego it is something that happens automatically at a certain stage in your life and as you advance in spiritual life you use the the phrase consciousness absolute rather than absolute consciousness is, is there a distinction uh, one can make a distinction where consciousness is in terms of so that is there but that's consciousness uh, that's absolute consciousness but consciousness absolute is the ultimate reality so it's just another word for god it's another word for you can't say nothingness because it can be absolutely positive so as as a as a man who's inquired into the world's religions do you see at some point in the future a world without religion if we are to follow this concept of the pinnacle of the the realization of a life of faith being it's, nothingness it's difficult to see what's happening in the future it all depends on so many factors in life what's going to happen do you, do you ever see the day that perhaps there is a a global one world religion a one world family i hope there will be but i can't foresee that for the present and if there was to be do do you think the roots of that would come from hinduism christianity from islam from from all the religions from all 
Well, let's move on because that, that's actually connected to the next question I have. Uh, many of the world's religions have this concept of Messiah, a savior who is to come. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean to you? Can you explain that? It means what that people, they are not very satisfied with the happening around them. And they think in terms of a solution to this problem. And they wish and hope that there will be a kind of a uh, happening that will, that will take place. And Buddhists think in terms of the Buddha coming back again to life. Christians think in terms of this, uh, Jesus Christ uh, coming a second time. And the Muslims also have a similar, a similar idea. These are ideas of, of people thinking <clears throat> that the only way to solve the problem is the emergence of some person who can sort of give the kind of experience that they have had in their tradition. But do you see a Messiah coming from <clears throat> any of these faiths, but actually not for the sake of just that particular faith, but for the sake of the world, the people of the world? No, I don't think in those terms, because you come to a stage where you think in terms of an illusion, and there's positive in everything, and there's negative in everything. And everything is, is everything, all, everything. So we can see that in, in the world's face, individuals look towards a Messiah, they, they need a Messiah. But how can individuals themselves become divine beings? Individuals don't become individual, don't become divine beings. When their individuality disappears, the divine being emerges, and that divine being, we use the word being, but that is an ultimate reality that emerges. And that's consciousness absolute. But what's the path, Professor? How do you, how do you actually take the steps to reach that goal? Meditation is the basic form. And within meditation, the basic form is the repetition of a mantra. And that you get in all the religions, as I explained earlier. But what people don't understand is what happens when you meditate. And people have gone further on in the path. They will come, they will, if you ask them, they will tell you what has happened and what will happen and so on. And, uh, but ultimately, uh, it is the elimination of consciousness and the act, uh, absolute purification of the body and the mind. Energized, purified, made different. But in, in the world that we live in, to purify the body, to, uh, even on the physical level, to as we were talking earlier about chakras and, and the, the physical chakras, mm -hmm. the, the sexual mm -hmm. desires, mm -hmm. the sexual needs, uh, even just to overcome those, and many of us struggle with that. So even just to say, go beyond that uh, challenge, mm -hmm. how can we even take it? So not to sound uh, uh, as if I'm disrespecting the idea, but is, just, is meditation, it, is that it? Is that enough? Meditation is basic, but after that, uh, alongside that, uh, you, you, the, the relationship you have with people, and uh, that's uh, meditation for love and kindness. And in terms of the physical body, the kind of food you eat and the quantity of food you eat, all that is important. What about actually going into the world and, and doing something that makes a difference, to, to make an impact in the world? Well, some people call it karma yoga, where you do good to people, go help and so on. And <clears throat> that is one way in which the, the ego can be sort of eliminated. Doing something for others. Yeah, doing something. That's karma yoga. Jnana yoga is where you do with the mind. Jnana is mind. Can you explain that? 
Jnana means mind, and that is where you sort of eliminate the concept of self by forms of meditation. So are you actually saying that in the mind you can live for the sake of others by meditating in a, in a higher dimension? It all depends on the type of life you live. But there are some, of course, who think in terms of meditation as being reclusive. There are think, other people who think in terms of helping others, doing good to others, not thinking about, about themselves at all. And uh, that is life for them. Okay, finally, Professor Barrera, this, this concept of consciousness absolute, um, this is something you, uh, again, discovered. Um, is this the, the end of your quest for spiritual truth? I didn't discover that. They discovered me. <laughs> Happens. And when you know it, you don't know it. And those yes. who know it... Mm. That's right. <coughs> That's really what certain people say. Those who have it, don't know it. They don't know that they have it. They just go about the world as if nothing has happened. And then go, they go, go on telling people, I have achieved enlightenment, I have done this, I have done this. They forget everything. And they just go over among people, doing good, being kind to people, and being reclusive. And the, at a, uh, the, the, the old you get, you become more and more of a recluse. The younger people have more energy, so they do uh, doing good to people and that kind of thing. And Professor Perra, that's going to be my last question. What is your advice to a young person who's out there seeking spiritual truth? It has been said that the longest journey starts with the first foot forward. Some go fast, some go slowly, some idle on the way and stop. But it is necessary to go on and on and on. And when you come to a certain stage, uh, there is, according to Buddhist tradition, a kind of a river to cross. And when you come there, to go across, they use a boat. And it is said that the boat is a kind of technique for meditation. And with that, you cross to the other side. But when you cross to the other side, you don't carry the boat on your head, you leave it behind. And meditation is left behind, and you are different. But there are some who sort of go up, go forward and backward on the boat, try to find out why the boat is working, is it a small boat or large boat, and all the techniques of what the boat is like. Those are meditation teachers who sort of uh, think about meditation, but they don't cross over and leave the boat aside and go to the other side. Well, thank you very, very much, Professor Pereira, for sharing your 87 years of experience, wisdom and insights with us today. Well, you've been watching The Defining Moment for creating the culture of conscience. If you'd like to see more of our shows, you can find us on the web at www.definingmoment.eu. Thank you for watching and we wish you all the best.